I'm Jay Elias, General Legal Counsel at Dyer Lake Funeral Home in North Attleboro. Welcome to this episode of Live and Learn, a series of programs designed to be informative, educational, and upbeat, and always intended to enhance and encourage our personal wellness and awareness. This episode is about the sounds in our lives and the relationship we have with sound. The sound of music, dogs barking, birds chirping, horns honking, voices that calm us and voices that alarm us. The sound of a babbling brook and the thunderous roar of a waterfall. So, as trite as this question may seem, if a tree falls in a forest and there's no one around to hear it, does it make a sound? Well, the answer may depend on your interpretation of the word sound. If by sound we mean the vibrations that move as a wave of pressure through air, water, or other transmission, then the tree probably does make a sound when it falls, and that's based on our assumption that vibrations were produced by the falling tree. On the other hand, sound has sometimes been defined as the sensation we experience when our ears detect those vibrations and send information about those vibrations to our brain. In other words, by that definition, sound is what we hear, that is, the perception in our brains. So using that definition, that is, if sound is what we hear and no one is around to hear the tree fall, well, maybe it doesn't make a sound. It's been said that the difference between sound and noise depends upon the listener and the circumstances. Certain music, for example, can be a pleasurable sound to one person and an annoying sound to another. At a scientific level, sound and noise may technically be the same. They're that vibration that we detect with our ears. Sound versus noise. Is it that sound is something that we hear, generally speaking, but noise is something that we can hear but don't necessarily want to? And by the way, we often use the words sound and noise interchangeably, but they really have different connotations. Think of your old car radio, for example. When you turn the dial to a station, yes, a dial, you heard music. And in between those set stations and the music you heard, you heard static. The dictionary definition of sound often refers to it as either those mechanical vibrations transmitted through a medium of some sort, traveling in air at a speed of approximately 1,087 feet per second, or a particular auditory effect, or to be heard, or to be safe or free from flaw, defect, or in good condition, mechanically sound, for example. And it can refer to something being strong, secure, and reliable, sometimes in terms of investments, to sound investment. And the word sound derives from the Latin sonus, which means sound. Then again, a noise is a type of sound, but is usually used to refer to loud or unwanted sounds. In physics and in electronics, noise is a mostly unwanted random addition to a signal, similar to that static on your radio. We often associate noise with sounds like car horns, planes, yelling, and even music that we find unpleasant or instruments that are horribly played. The word noise is actually derived from the Latin word nausea, meaning seasickness. Consider how different it would have been to watch, say, Julie Andrews as Maria von Trapp singing atop the hills and mountains of Austria in a much-loved movie called The Noise of Music instead of The Sound of Music, or listening to Simon and Garfunkel singing the noise of silence rather than the sound of silence, or reading The Noise and the Fury, thinking it was instead William Faulkner's famous novel, The Sound and the Fury, Sound and Noise. We hear everything around us all day long, sometimes into the night. We hear the sound of an alarm clock or maybe just the ticking of a watch, the sound of our cell phones or our neighbor's phones. Doors opening, doors closing, cars, trucks, buses, airplanes, construction, people talking to one another. Maybe it's the background sound of televisions or radios that are always on. 
And when a sound first enters our ears, we begin processing it on a subconscious level. As those sound waves progress through our brain, it's processed by a number of increasingly sophisticated way stations that range from the undetectable to others that ignite our fight and flight response or maybe trigger our memories, evoke our emotions, or cue other physiological reactions. Let's say you hear the voice of someone you're madly in love with. Your body reacts hormonally to the sound. You either perk up or calm down at the sound of their voice. Maybe your heartbeat quickens with anticipation of seeing them. On the other hand, you're sitting quietly, enjoying a movie on television, reading a book, just looking out the window when you hear the voice of someone who is, to put it nicely, uh, pain. They always cause you anguish or grief or even fear. And the sound of their voice, it's anything but calming. And you know you'll inevitably get stressed, so your heartbeat also quickens, but not in a good way. And your breathing may grow more rapid and you get agitated just hearing that voice that bothersome voice, that sound. You may not be aware of it all the time, but the low frequency noise, those ambient background sounds that are always there, they can draw, grind down our energy reserves. They can wear us down physically and emotionally. And after a while, people report feeling more physically tired and mentally exhausted, even depressed, when they're always subjected to some kind of noise. It can impact our sleep, our creativity, our mood, our appetite, our ability to think clearly. In one research study, it was found that employee productivity was decreased by up to 65% because of an open concept floor plan of the workspace, which resulted in the absence of any quiet areas there was no closing the door to escape the sound of the office din or the sound of co-workers. And think about how many times you've said, enough, I wish I could just turn off that phone or that person. Scientists studying people living near several major European airports found even a small increase in aircraft noise was associated with a significant increase in the use of anxiety medication. And another study found that people living in areas with more road traffic noise were 25% more likely than those living in quieter neighborhoods to have symptoms of depression and heart problems. Researchers suspect that noise can actually aggravate health conditions by inducing higher levels of stress. When you experience noise in the middle of the night, for example, you have an awakening reaction whether it's the hum of an always-on TV or that beeping from your cell phone. And in a study that simulated the effects of nighttime noise, participants listened to recordings containing the sound of aircraft noise while they slept at home. And not surprisingly, participants slept worse on the nights they heard the noise. But what was surprising was that the lab tests conducted the following morning showed those people experienced vascular damage and inflammation and higher levels of stress hormones. On the other hand, research studies have connected exposure to the soothing sound of wind, of water, of bird songs, to decreased levels of stress. And it seems that just hearing the sound of birds nearby makes many of us feel happier and even more secure. We've learned that when the birds are happily tweeting, things are normally safe. So if you want to turn off all that noise pollution, why don't you just use earplugs? While earplugs may be suitable for use on occasion, it's reported that prolonged use can actually cause damage and their constant use can decrease the effectiveness of our auditory system's internal alarms, which urge us to protect ourselves from threats. Then there's the sound of music, thought to be the best thing we have to compensate for that noisy world we live in. It seems that if you're willing to listen to new and different types of music, it'll actually help form new neural connections in your brain. And when you listen to music that pleases you, it can have a beneficial effect on health, including lowering your blood pressure. By the way, noise pollution, 
It's been a problem for city dwellers since Roman times. There were actually laws prohibiting the driving of chariots through the cobblestone streets of Rome at night. Our ears are incredibly sensitive to sound. They can hear everything from your fingertip brushing lightly over a piece of paper to that roar of a loud jet engine overhead. To put in perspective in terms of power, the sound of that jet engine is about one trillion times more powerful than the smallest audible sound. That's not a trillion times louder, it's a trillion times more powerful. And how do we measure the intensity of sound? Well, that's done in terms of decibels. On the decibel scale, the smallest audible sound, which is near total silence, is zero decibels. A sound 10 times more powerful is 10 decibels, and one 100 times more powerful than near total silence is 20 decibels. And we all know from experience that distance affects the intensity of sound. If we're far away, the power is greatly diminished. And just for example, consider this. Near total silence registers about zero decibels. A whisper, 15 decibels. Normal conversation would be at 60 decibels. The lawnmower outside, 90 decibels. A car horn, 110. A police or rescue siren or a jet engine, 120 decibels. And a gunshot or a firecracker, 140 decibels. Any sound above 80 decibels has been noted to cause hearing loss over a prolonged period of time. And the loss is related to both the power of the sound as well as the length of exposure. And you know you're listening to an 85 decibel sound if you have to raise your voice to be heard by somebody else. It's also recognized that eight hours of exposure to 90 decibel sound, that lawnmower all day long, can cause damage to your ears and any exposure to 140 decibel sound will probably cause not only immediate damage but pain. Here's a thought. The sound output of a police or rescue siren has risen significantly over the past 50 years in most cities, about 40 decibels more than before. And although rescue sirens need to be among the loudest of city sounds, for a variety of reasons, it's become harder to hear those sounds. Whether or not it's more traffic and street activity, an overall increased ambient sound level in our cities, the increased use of soundproofing materials used in cars, and even the quality and intensity of sound systems in those cars. Think about it. About 50 years ago, most cars came equipped with one, maybe two radio speakers. Today, Many new cars are equipped with as many as 20 speakers plus subwoofers to intensify the sound and the bass. In one published study, the occupants of a car with the windows rolled up were asked to identify the direction a siren was coming from, and only about a third of the occupants guessed correctly. That study found that someone in a vehicle with the radio playing, the windows up, the air conditioning on, they weren't able to hear a siren approaching until that vehicle is extremely close, within 200 feet. And at that range, especially at any significant speed, the siren would be of little value. So siren manufacturers have responded to the problem in a number of ways. They've developed new types of sirens, two-tone sirens, wailing sirens, trying to capture the listener's attention. And in a number of communities, including some of our local ones, alternatives to sirens are being used. Many traffic signals are now equipped with an emergency vehicle preemption device that's installed on emergency vehicles, on the traffic lights themselves, and can be worked remotely or by fire station or by a dispatcher. That traffic preemption device will cause the traffic light in the path of a vehicle to immediately grant the emergency vehicle right of way. And speaking of towns and cities and Massachusetts, by the way, some cities have passed ordinances that prohibit unnecessary noise coming from a vehicle. In Lemonster, for example, noise that's audible in a public place 
at a distance of 50 feet or more coming from a vehicle can result in a $100 fine. And in Dennis, a $50 fine can be imposed when the sound is plainly audible at a distance of 150 feet from the vehicle. In Salem, that cutoff is 50 feet, whether or not it's a boat or a car, as long as it's in public waters. Hearing the sound of a loved one snoozing in their favorite chair might make you feel as though everything is right in the world, while someone else may search for a nearby pillow to quiet those breath sounds. Does the sound of someone chewing loudly at the table next to you or snapping their gum bother you? Would that be a little bother or a rage-filled reaction? Misophonia is a phenomenon characterized by intense emotional reactions, anger, rage, anxiety, disgust, in response to highly specific sounds like people chewing, sniffing, slurping, smacking their lips, or maybe just breathing. Believe it or not, some people will avoid restaurants because they cannot stand the sound of other people chewing. Misophonia usually appears around age 12, probably affects more people than we realize or may be willing to admit. And other than avoiding other people altogether, it's suggested that those who are susceptible to those strong misophonic reactions should seek to adopt relaxation techniques, including, ironically, controlled breathing, which they can employ in anticipation of a situation like when they're with other people and they can't avoid them. And how many times have you heard your own voice and said, that's not what I sound like? Few of us like to hear the sound of our own voice when we hear it on a recording. Even those who love to sing aloud loudly to their favorite song when no one's listening will tell you that listening to a recording of their own voice is nothing short of cringeworthy. There's actually a scientific reason behind this discomfort we have in hearing our own voice in a recording, and it's based on equal parts of physiology and psychology. It seems that the sound from a recording of your voice is in fact transmitted differently to your brain than is the sound you generate when you speak. When you're listening to a recording of your voice, the sound travels through the air and into your ears. That's referred to as air conduction. The sound energy vibrates the eardrum and the small ear bones in your ear, which in turn transmits the sound to your inner ear stimulating certain nerves which then send that auditory signal to your brain. It's a process. But when you speak or sing and hear your own voice directly, the sound from your voice reaches your inner ear in a totally different way. While some of the sound is transmitted through air conduction, much of the sound is internally conducted directly through your skull bones. And when you hear your own voice when you speak, it's due to a blend of both that external air conduction and the internal conduction. That internal conduction boosts the lower frequencies of your voice, which is why most of us perceive our voice to be deeper and richer when we speak than when we hear our voice in a recording. There's also another reason why hearing a recording of your voice can be so disconcerting. That's the psychological piece of it. And that's because it really is something of a new voice to you. It exposes a difference between your self-perception, what you sound like, and the reality of what other people hear when they listen to you. Because your voice is such a unique and vital part of your self-identity, that mismatch of sounds can be jarring. You realize that other people have been hearing something different than the sound than you've heard all these years, and you're so used to hearing yourself sound a certain way that it's difficult to reconcile that sound. You hear your own voice constantly, as you do when you talk to yourself, or even when you read to yourself. You have a sense of what you sound like and what you should sound like, because you hear your own voice directly every single day. And although the thought of singing in front of other people may fill you with a sense of dread, for most of us, there's one place where we tend to have little inhibition in belting out our favorite tunes, and that's in the shower. 
Even though, as we mentioned, most of us cringe at hearing the sound of our own recorded voice, oddly, for many of us, our shower singing voice can sound pretty good, at least to us. Why is that? Well, it seems there are a few basic ingredients you need in order to create perfect acoustics, and that shower basically has those ingredients. First, maybe most importantly, it's about the material that makes up those shower walls. For most of us, our showers are made up of ceramic tiles. Sometimes the walls, the floor, and the ceiling are made of ceramic tile. And there may be a window in the room and a mirror, all things that reflect sound. Next is the size of the area. Most showers, for most of us, are relatively small. And when the sound of your voice isn't absorbed by the walls or the ceiling or the floor, it bounces around quite a bit, especially thanks to that close proximity of the small space. And that gives your voice more power and more volume and more amplitude. It sounds better to you. And most showers aren't perfectly symmetrical in shape. So some of the sound waves travel farther than others and your singing voice becomes somewhat stretched out, reverberating and giving it an embellished, extra rich sound. That same reverberation also helps to even out your pitch, which is great for those of us who don't have perfect pitch and really aren't capable of singing the musical notes accurately. Finally, there's the sound of the rush of water itself, acting like the sound of background singers or musicians who are there to accompany you as you belt out your favorite tunes to your heart's abandon. Changing gears a bit, in 2014, a documentary film called Alive Inside was released. In it, the filmmaker followed a social worker by the name of Dan Cohen who was bringing music to people with dementia and Alzheimer's who resided in nursing homes. Cohen asked the resident's family to list the songs or musical pieces the person once enjoyed, and then he'd create an individualized playlist the music elicited surprising reactions from the resident. Some people who had seemed unable to speak proceeded to sing and dance to their music. Others were able to recount when and where they had listened to that music. The music seemed to open doors to the resident's memory vaults. And there's a strong body of evidence to support the idea that listening to and even performing music actually reactivates areas of the brain associated with memory, reasoning, speech, emotion, and reward. Music doesn't just help us retrieve stored memories, it helps us lay down new ones. Research has also shown that singing lyrics can be especially helpful to people who are recovering from a stroke or other brain injury because singing ability may originate in the undamaged right side of the brain, people may be able to learn to speak their thoughts by singing them first and gradually dropping the melody. And here's one. Grammy award-winning singer and artist Tony Bennett has been suffering from Alzheimer's disease for several years. Although he still recognized his family, both his short-term and long-term memory were deteriorating dramatically. Even after his diagnosis, though, between 2018 and 2020, he recorded a second album of duets with Lady Gaga as a follow-up to their number one album in 2014. Although Bennett often seemed lost and bewildered between taping sessions, he had little trouble when it came to singing and recording the album. Musical knowledge, like with Tony Bennett, seems to be stored as procedural memory, which is associated with routines and repetitive activities like tying your shoelaces or buttoning a button, which tend to remain largely intact during Alzheimer's. And here's an interesting one. In 2011, marketing experts in Finland gathered with the modest goal of making that remote and medium-sized country a world-famous tourist destination. The problem was that Finland was known as a rather quiet country. Without a national brand, they needed something that would garner attention. And the experts puzzled over the various strengths of that nation. A country with exceptional teachers, an abundance of wild berries and mushrooms, a vibrant cultural capital. Someone jokingly proposed quiet 
was one of the country's strengths, and it got the panel thinking. Finland saw that it was possible to quite literally make something out of nothing, that is, silence. So in 2011, the Finnish tourist board released a series of photographs of lone figures in the wilderness with the caption, silence, please. And the tagline, no talking, but action. Silence is a peculiar starting point for a marketing campaign. After all, you can't weigh it, record it, export it. You can't eat it, collect it, or give it away. But the Finland campaign raised the question of just what the tangible effects of silence really are. And even though we usually think of silence as a lack of input, our brains are structured to recognize it whenever that silence represents a sharp break from sounds. While it's clear that external silence can have tangible benefits, scientists are discovering that under the hoods of our skulls, there isn't really such a thing as silence. It seems that in the absence of sound, our brains often tend to produce internal representations of sound. We imagine we're listening to a song on the radio. When you do so, and the power is actually interrupted, neurologists have found that if you know the song well, your brain's auditory cortex remains active, as if the music is still playing. And so what you're hearing isn't being generated by that outside world, the radio that went off. Instead, you're retrieving a memory and an illusion of sound. And that's an interesting reminder of our brain's imaginative power. On the blank sensory slate of silence, our mind can conduct its own symphonies. And finally, there are times when we could all use a little peace and quiet in our lives with no sound and no noise. Silence. Well, the quietest place on earth, according to the Guinness Book of World Records, was a room, actually something called an anechoic chamber at Orfield Laboratories in southern Minnesota. Anechoic means echo-free. Inside that chamber, it is silent, really silent, completely silent, silent, and dark, completely dark. It's so silent that the background noise is measured as negative decibels, negative 9.4 decibels. And the chamber actually absorbs 99.99% of all sound. Compare that with what you think of as a typically quiet bedroom at night, which still measures about 30 decibels. The chamber, it's made of 3.3 foot thick fiberglass, acoustic wedges, double walls of insulated steel, foot thick concrete. It's open to the public by reservation, but people are only allowed in it for a short supervised stay. And according to the lab's website, only members of the media are permitted to stay for prolonged periods of time. The longest anyone has stayed has been a reporter who lasted 45 minutes. 45 minutes, that's all. Most people generally leave after half that time, tortured by, of all things, the eerie sounds of their own body. It's said that in the anechoic chamber, you become the sound. Consider that in the absence of any outside noise, your ears will adapt to the silence around you. And the only sounds you'll hear in that chamber are the sounds of your own breathing, your own heartbeat, and your own stomach. And those sounds are your only references for your location, which makes it a very disconcerting and disorienting experience. Because it's both completely dark and completely silent, the only way to stay in the room for any period of time is to sit down. That's because our orientation is largely secured by the sounds made when we walk or stand. And when those sound cues are taken away, your perception becomes skewed and imbalanced and movement becomes almost impossible. So maybe a bit of noise isn't all that bad. I'm Jay Elias. Thank you for watching this episode of Live and Learn. I hope you enjoyed it and I look forward to your joining me again for another program designed to enhance and encourage your personal wellness and awareness.